Welcome to Urban Dharma, the podcast, where suffering is optional. Hi, this is Reverend Kusla coming to you from downtown Los Angeles, from the International Buddhist Meditation Center in the heart of Koreatown. Well, it's a warm and sunny day this February day in Los Angeles. They say it's going to get up to 80 degrees. Go figure. But what you're about to hear is a talk I gave uh, December 15th, 2007, at a Church of Religious Science in Glendale, California. They thought it would be interesting to have me talk about my journey as a Buddhist. So this talk is pretty much about me as a Buddhist and about my journey. Hope you find it interesting. Hope you find it useful. So with no further introduction, in Glendale, California, my talk on being a Buddhist and my Buddhist journey. I'm going to record what I have to, am I on here? I'm going to record what I have to say today just in case I say something profound. Uh, I can have it for posterity. When I was thinking about what I was going to talk about today, uh, I I thought I would talk about my journey uh, because we all have our spiritual journey. And, um, And mine took a few directions that surprised me. Uh, and maybe it'll surprise you, or maybe it'll make perfect sense to you. But I was born a Lutheran, uh, no fault of my own, and, um, and I enjoyed being a Lutheran, and my parents enjoyed me being a Lutheran. Uh, but I found that I, I had difficulty in having a relationship with God, that... that um, in my youth, I looked at God as simply the ultimate parent who would uh, uh, reprimand me uh, if I was unskillful and reward me uh, if I happened to do something that pleased him. Uh, and then the 60s happened, and I found myself in high school, and I found myself saying, don't trust anyone over 30. <laughs> And, and um, so I decided to become an agnostic. Uh, and I decided to question all authority, which was the appropriate thing to do in the 60s. Uh, and, and that worked for a while. I was very happy as sort of a non-religious, secular human being, working and enjoying the, the fruits of uh, labor and uh, pleasure. And then I turned 28 years old, and it was a traumatic experience for me. It was the first time in my life that I felt I was getting old. I was, I had uh, just watched a movie called Logan's Run. And in this movie, people uh, had a crystal implanted in the palm of their hand. And when they turned 30, it started to blink. And they were all rounded up and you never saw them again. (laughs) And I think that movie affected me at a subconscious level because I realized for the first time in my life that I was mortal and that I was going to have to die. And I didn't think that was fair uh, because hadn't there ever been somebody who didn't die? And... I searched and searched and found out that, no, everybody had to die, even Jesus. So I said to myself, well, if I have to die, I better get a pretty good religion so I can die well. (laughs) And I went to the bookstore, where else would you go to find a religion, and bought a book by Houston Smith called World Religions. And there was a nice small chapter on each of the major religions, and I read the chapter on Buddhism twice. There was something about hearing the words of the Buddha that spoke to me clearly. It was more than anything else about being a human being. And, and I thought, I qualify. <laughs> you know, because I never felt I would be more than that. 
And yet a lot of people I knew wanted to be. But I felt something, uh, I felt it was comfortable to be a human being. That was part of my life in, in this existence. And so I got another book, the phone book, and found a meditation center. And that was my first introduction to suffering. Because I thought I had a pretty good life. And then as I read and started to understand the teachings of the Buddha, I realized my life sucked. (laughs) That I was born, and because I was born, I was going to have to get old. And because I was born, I was going to have to get sick. And because I was born, I was going to have to die. And everything I truly loved and cherished and wanted to hold on to would be taken away from me because of impermanence and change. And all the people I didn't want to see and all the places I didn't want to be in, I found myself in those places and around those people, and there was nothing I could do about it. That was the first noble truth. And I'm going, geez, this is pretty hard to swallow the first time. So what's the point of having a life if everything in life is ultimately unsatisfactory? But I continue to read, and the second truth explain to me why it was unsatisfactory. It explained to me that my life was unsatisfactory because I was selfish. And all I wanted to do every day, in every way, was to hold on to all the good stuff and push away all the bad stuff. And because I was born with original ignorance, not original sin, according to Buddhism, I never got it right. I couldn't see the world the way it really was. I couldn't hold on to the good stuff. There was no one to hold on to it, and there was nothing to hold on to. Wow. I kept reading the third truth. Nirvana, the end of my suffering, the end of my karma, the end of all future rebirths. And I said to myself, do I want to end all future rebirths? Do I want to not exist Is that how I escape suffering? By not existing? What did the Buddha do? How did he end his suffering? Where did he go when he died? It said he didn't go to heaven. We have over 30 heavens in Buddhism. We have over 30 hells in Buddhism. We have many places to go. (laughs) But it said he didn't go to any of those. He found his way to nirvana. And I said to myself, wow, what he succeeded in doing was existing without being created. He was able to exist without creation. Now, I know that sounds really weird because everything in our whole universe, in all our reality, was created. As a Buddhist, I don't have to define first cause. I let you do that. Some Buddhists I know consider God as being the first cause. Other Buddhists I know prefer the Big Bang Theory. It's just a bit more interesting to read. (laughs) And some Buddhists prefer the Flying Spaghetti Monster. Now, if you've never heard of that theory, it's on the Internet. And it said the flying spaghetti monster was the first cause. You can even get a t-shirt with the flying spaghetti monster on it. So as a Buddhist, I have a variety of ways of understanding the first cause. But creation, according to Buddhism, seems, seems to be the problem, because everything that is created has to die. So if we could exist without being created, we wouldn't have to die. We wouldn't have to get old, and we wouldn't have to get sick. And that's what the Buddha did. He figured it out. And he called it nirvana. Nirvana is the end of suffering in this life while we're still alive, and the end of all future suffering, because existence is not dependent on creation. I continue to read. What did I have to do to become a Buddhist? Do You know, there are many kinds of Buddhists. There are religious Buddhists. I'm one of those. There are lifestyle Buddhists. There are therapeutic Buddhists 
who prefer Buddhism over counseling. And there are philosophical Buddhists who spend most of their time in the library trying to figure out what it all means. But I wanted to be a religious Buddhist. What did I have to do? I said to myself. They said to me, the first thing you need to do is accept the five precepts. And I said, well, what are those? The five precepts are choosing not to kill. Choosing not to steal. Choosing not to indulge in sexual misconduct. Choosing not to lie. Choosing not to consume intoxicants. And I said to my teacher, but I don't have a choice yet. I gave my choice away. Buddhism allows us to get our choice back. Now, I know we all think we have a choice, but I think today especially... In the consumer-oriented culture we live in, we have given up our citizenship and we are now consumers of America. Our choice is the red one or the blue one. I wanted more than that. I wanted the choice of, of doing or not doing. I wanted the choice of simplicity or complexity. I wanted to choose how to live my life in a way that allowed me to suffer less and others to suffer less as well. And I started to see the five precepts allowed me to not have to decide on, do I kill? But rather, it encouraged me to figure out a way not to kill. I was giving a talk at, at a high school just a couple days ago in Paulus Verdes. And one of the students said, well, how do you practice not killing? Because you look at television and every primetime program is about killing. And you look at the movies and people are being slaughtered left and right. And you look in the newspapers and everybody's dying all the time. The remarkable thing to me is that nobody ever, no two people ever die the same way. We all die in a unique way. Wow. Maybe that's why there's so many TV programs about dying. And I said to them, well, this is how I started to practice not killing that I would wake up in the morning and I'd say to myself, today I'm not killing any human beings. And I'd walk out that door with confidence. I knew I could do it. And I would make it through the whole day and not take anybody out. (laughs) Then I wanted to go to the next level of not killing. So I said to myself, today I'm not killing any lions or tigers or bears. Oh my. (laughs) And I could make it through the whole day. And when I got good at that, I said, I'm not killing any mosquitoes, flies, cockroaches, or ants. I failed miserably. (laughs) But they just want to live, too. I came to understand. So my job really was deciding not whether I should or shouldn't, but how not to. How many different ways can I figure out not to kill? And that's a full-time job. Right now we have ants in the meditation center. It's a tough one. Sometimes you may have to take one or two out. (laughs) But at our center, if we find ourselves killing a few ants, we wish them a good rebirth. I approached each of those precepts the same way. I wanted to see what it meant not to steal, what it meant not to indulge in sexual misconduct, what it meant not to lie, and why was it wrong not to consume intoxicants. After all, doesn't everybody like to get high? At our center, at New Year's Eve, we meditate and then we eat chocolate. That's how we get high. But what's wrong with consuming alcohol or drugs? What's the problem? I've read reports that having a beer or wine with your meal is actually good for you. It's medicine. In Germany, they say beer is food. So what did the Buddha say? The problem was with alcohol or drugs. He said this. He said it steals your wisdom. You end up doing stupid things, create more suffering for yourself or others, and you go right back to where you started from. You could have a Ph.D. from UCLA, a couple cases of beer, you're illiterate. (laughs) 
So if you're working that hard to acquire wisdom and compassion, the Buddhist ideals, why throw it all away in one night? So that's what's wrong with alcohol or drugs, according to Buddhism. If I wanted to be a Buddhist, I needed to accept the three refuges. I need to, needed to accept the Buddha as a world teacher, the one who could show me how he ended his suffering, the one who could show me how to be free. Not everybody wants to be free. Most people simply want to be comfortable. They're willing to settle for that. But there are a few Buddhists who choose to be free. If you're a Buddhist monk or nun, you have to accept the vow of celibacy. A year and a half ago, I went to St. John's University. And um, there was, it's also an, a Catholic abbey. And the Benedictines are there. And we had a conference on celibacy. We had 15 Buddhist monks and 15 Catholic monks. It was so much fun. Nothing like hearing old guys talk about celibacy. <laughs> and, and one of my jobs was to give a presentation on why Buddhist monks are celibate. The Catholics are celibate for a different reason. But the Buddhists are celibate because, number one, they live in an economy of generosity. They have to have a simple lifestyle, a lifestyle that is supportable by donations. And if you have a wife and a couple kids and a mortgage and two car payments, and your eldest son has to go to college now, it's hard to get enough donations to live in that way. If you're single and live in a room and have an old car, you know, it doesn't take very much to keep you alive, to meet your needs. You may not get your wants met, but you do get your needs met. But more importantly, I found out as I was doing my research for my presentation, a Buddhist monk or nun wants to be free. And if you're in a relationship, you can be happy, you can be fulfilled, you can be satisfied, but you will never be free. Now, I probably don't need to tell you that, but when I'm speaking to high school kids, they have no idea what freedom means, or why it's even desirable. So, I see that being a Buddhist, and being a Buddhist monastic in particular, allows me to view the world in a much different way, in a unique way, in a godless way. Now, that might sound like a rather uncomfortable statement to listen to, but when I was studying Buddhism... I wondered if the Buddha believed in God. Because he never talked about the one God, the God most people think is the only God. He talked about many gods, a hierarchy of gods, stronger gods and weaker gods. So it seems to me the Buddha was a theist. He did believe in the gods of India. He never met a Jew, though. He never met anyone who believed in only one God the god of monotheism. Not because that god doesn't exist, but because the Buddha never went any further than 300 miles from his birthplace. So why didn't the Buddha talk about the gods of India in all the talks he gave on suffering? And then I imagined, on a full moon night, the Buddha going to a, a hill or a cliff and looking at the stars in the sky and saying, I have seen so much suffering. I have seen the, the old suffer and the sick suffer and the dying suffer. If you truly created this world, can't you end suffering for humans? Can't you step forward? And he listened carefully, I think, for a response and heard nothing. And I think at that moment, a seed was planted, a resolve was made, that he was going to find the end of suffering. If the gods couldn't do it, he would do it. And at the age of, of 19, he, he went into the streets of the city and saw the, the four signs. At the age of 35, after having his first child born, he left his wife and child in the care of his parents and went to the edge of the forest 
And from 29 to 35, he practiced asceticism, meditation, renunciation, all the things that they do in India. Where is suffering come from? How can I end my suffering? What do I need to do to be free from suffering? Nobody could tell him. But he made a lot of headway. And it said on the full moon day of May, he was 99% of the way to his release from suffering, to his salvation. Couldn't figure out how to do it. He sat beneath the tree, later called the Bodhi tree, the tree of enlightenment. And he achieved his perfection as a human being. In some forms of Christianity, that's impossible. In Buddhism, that's our potential. Our potential for human perfection. Let me define it for you. A perfect human, instead of having lust, only has love. A perfect human, instead of having greed, only has generosity. A perfect human, instead of having hatred and anger, only has loving kindness and compassion. A perfect human, instead of being deluded and ignorant, only has wisdom. Everything they think, say, and do manifests in a skillful way, reducing suffering in the world. He achieved that perfection. We call Buddha nature the potential we all have to achieve, to achieve our perfection as a human being. I was speaking to some of my Catholic priest friends, and, and one of the priests came up to me and says, Ah, Kusla, I see the spark of God in you. I said, Ah, Father, I see Buddha nature in you. As I continued to study Buddhism and practice Buddhism, I realized that I was suffering less. Even less than before I had come to Buddhism. My life was becoming more peaceful and simple. I was starting to see with greater clarity what I needed to do and what I needed not to do. And as I continue in my practice today, I have found service to community to be the most fulfilling and rewarding of my practices. For a year, I was a volunteer at California State Prison for Men up in Lancaster, California. For five years, I was a volunteer at Central Juvenile Hall in downtown Los Angeles, giving two presentations a week on how to end suffering to the young people behind bars there. I'm still at UCLA. I'm a Buddhist chaplain there. We have a Buddhist club that meets every Tuesday in the Catholic Center. I'm on the Spiritual Care Committee at the Medical Center, and I give presentations to the new chaplains, at the Medical Center, on Buddhist patient care and end-of-life issues. We get sick and die differently than Christians do. And I want the chaplains to know how to work with us. And for seven years, I was a volunteer police chaplain in Garden Grove. So I have seen people suffer in many different ways. I've come to the conclusion that Buddhism is the only religion that focuses on suffering, that focuses on how to end suffering, how to be released from suffering. And not everybody needs to be a Buddhist. I have come to the conclusion as well that Buddhism is the best religion for Buddhists. But that's about it. (laughs) And if you're not suffering, you don't need to talk to me. I've done over five weddings so far. I have nothing to say. I eat some cake and I go home after the service. Because they're happy. They're joyful. They may come and seek me out ten years from then, but at that moment, life is perfect. So if your life is perfect, you don't need Buddhism in your life. But if you think you might get sick, might get old, and might die, then Buddhism may have something to offer you. But can you practice Buddhism and your religion? Does that make sense at all? I would say no. I would say you have to commit. You can't be half and half. If you're half and half, where do you go when you die? You know? So I think Buddhism can shine a new light on your religion. I think it can allow you to ask different questions about what you're practicing and what your goals are and what it means to be a human being. But I don't think you need to be a Buddhist. I don't think most people need to be a Buddhist. For some reason, I needed to be a Buddhist. And I'm happy with that. Let me tell you how we proselytize at our center. We open the door and we light a stick of incense. 
somebody walks by and smells the incense, comes to the door and says, what's that? We talk to them. Other than that, we don't have much to offer. Buddhism is about being invited to speak, not how many times can I speak. And when I received the invitation to speak here, I said, how wonderful is that? Maybe somebody's suffering today, and maybe what I have to say will ease their suffering. So I accepted the five precepts of, of a Buddhist. I accepted the three refuges. And then I accepted meditation. The five precepts changed what I said and how I acted. But it didn't change my mind. Meditation is designed to change your mind. One teacher said, lose your mind and come to your senses. I like that idea. Our mind is trapped in past and future. It's always thinking about what needs to be done next and regretting what it didn't do last. How can we come to the present moment experience of our life? In meditation, that's the goal. One of the techniques is to use the sensation of breath. Simply following the sensation of breath, going out and coming in, going out and coming in. That sensation is always happening right now. It's not happening tomorrow. It's not happening yesterday. That's the portal to the present moment experience of your life. And for hours and hours, we Buddhists sit on the ground, experiencing sensation, realizing all the sensations are happening right now, and all those fears and anxieties of the future, regrets of the past, are simply mind-made. Nothing real. Those are the ghosts. And then we, then we take our meditation practice and we look at ourselves And we say, who am I really? Who am I really? Where do I exist? Is there a part of me that's unconditional? Is there a part of me that's unsupported? And as it turns out, according to Buddhism, there isn't. That none of us live independently. We are all codependent. We need each other, according to Buddhism. The ultimate reality in Buddhism is that the world is interconnected and interdependent. None of us exist separately. And then I thought to myself, well, who was I when I was 10? Who was I when I was 20 and 30? Where are they now? They're all dead. Those are my team members. Life is a team sport, according to Buddhism. And I have had generations, decades of team members passing the baton to the next team member. And now it's my turn. And I'm running my leg. And pretty soon I'll be 60 and I'll pass the baton off to the next decade runner. And hopefully they'll make it to 70 and they'll pass the baton again. But all those people I used to be are ghosts. All those issues I used to have, I put them to rest. I had a memorial service for those folks that used to live. I wish them well on their journey. But I got a lot of stuff to do right now. I can't be distracted by them. So Buddhism gave me a unique perspective on how I needed to live my life. How I needed to feel connected to all things. Not to be one with them. I've got an issue with that oneness, and I I hesitate to say that here because oneness is a very important concept. But for me, the concept that works is unity, not oneness. Oneness sometimes for me means uniformity. And if I can create unity, that allows for diversity. So I can be connected to all of you and not have to be any different than I am. But if I have to be one with you, I'm going to have to change. And that might be difficult. So I look at all the people in the world, and I'm connected to them, whether I want to be or not. They're my brothers and sisters. If one person is hungry in the world, gosh, there's a part of me that's hungry too. If one person is homeless in the world, gosh, there's a part of me that's homeless too. I can't turn my head. I can't bury it in the sand. I know through meditation, and through the teachings of the Buddha, that we are all interconnected 
and interdependent. Where do you go where no one suffers? I imagine Mother Teresa when she was alive, needing a vacation. Where would she go? I thought, ah, maybe Hawaii. A couple days on the beach just to mellow out after all the hard work in India. And then I imagine her going out and finding sunburn victims to care for. The work is never done. And as you become spiritually awake, you realize there is no time to rest. There's urgency in your life now. You might wake up a half hour earlier and stay up an hour later just to get those few things done because tomorrow is not guaranteed. And there are people suffering. And as a Buddhist, until the last person stops suffering, I got stuff to do. I have websites to do. I have newsletters to send out. I have podcasts to post. I have talks to give. Maybe one day I'll have a book to write. Don't know. But there's no time to rest. There's much work to do. So thank you again for inviting me to work. Have a great day. You're welcome. Well, that's it. That was my talk in Glendale, California on December 15th, 2007 on being a Buddhist and having a Buddhist journey. I hope you found it interesting. I hope you found it useful. If you'd like to download some free e-books on Buddhism, please visit buddhabooks.info. That's buddhabooks.info. Well, until the next time, until the next podcast, be happy, be peaceful, and most of all, be free from suffering.